Good afternoon and good evening to those who are joining in from the East Coast. My name is Chow Lee. I am a program coordinator at the Institute for Educational Advancement. We're an educational nonprofit providing nationwide programs and services to nurture the intellectual and personal growth of gifted and high potential youth. Welcome and thank you tonight for joining in on the book chat with Dr. Christine Fonseca. I will briefly introduce Dr. Fonseca and how we chose her book for our readathon, and then I will get the conversation started with Christine. Trained as an educational psychologist, Dr. Christine Fonseca is dedicated to helping children and adults connect with their personal truth. She is a critically acclaimed and award-winning author of nonfiction and fiction books and articles. Dr. Fonseca is also a nationally recognized speaker and an international consultant and coach. She has taught parenting classes for more than a decade, and she worked as a school psychologist in elementary, middle, and high school settings for more than 17 years. Currently, she works as a consultant, helping school districts support the behavioral and social emotional needs of students. She also coaches children and parents to work through their anxieties. For our readathon campaign, IEA chose to feature Dr. Fonseca's book, The Caring Child, Raising Empathetic and Emotionally Intelligent Children. We chose this book because we believe that during this challenging time, the ability to empathize connects us to one another, it builds common ground and makes us more resilient. This book pulls together the latest research from positive psychology to provide parents specific tools, tools to help their children develop healthy empathy and emotional intelligence. We hope that this book can be part of the positive messages we send out during our Readathon campaign. It is by supporting each other, we can be stronger together. If you would like to make a donation to IEA to support our campaign, please text the code READWITHIEA to 4432. Today is also our $10 Tuesday challenge. The challenge winner, which is the fundraiser with the most $10 donations can attend a four-part online spyglass workshop series for free. Thank you for helping us reach our goal Together, we can support more deserving children in need. So uh, joining me here, in addition to Dr. Fonseca, is also my co colleague, Nicole. And Nicole, would you please put the uh, donation text code in the chat? OK. While she's doing that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Dr. Fonseca. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. I hope you guys are all doing well. It is my true pleasure to be here. I wanted to share a little bit of information about The Caring Child and some of its content with you tonight, and then just take some questions and, and you know, be of any help that I can. So as we get started, I'm going to share my screen. All right, let me get to the right one. There we go. All right. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see that. Um, as I go through, please feel free to put any questions that you have in the chat. I'll kind of browse through that and um, respond to anything that I'm saying. I just, I love all that response. So um, as you know, my name is Christine Fonseca and I am first and foremost an author. I'm a whole bunch of things, but first and foremost, I am an author. Um, and I wrote The Caring Child out of a response to a lot of questions I was receiving, both as a school psychologist and educational psych, as well as um, as a consultant around how does empathy develop in children? And is it something that we can, as parents, help nurture or as educators help nurture? And so I really sought 
kind of answers to that question. And originally, I thought this was going to be a super easy book to write until I started doing a very deep dive on the most recent research in neuropsychology related to the development of empathy. And I quickly found out that there's actually a whole lot of different opinions as to what is and is not empathy and whether or not empathy is a good thing or not a good thing. Maybe we all should be compassionate above being empathetic, um, what are the drawbacks to empathy, et cetera, et cetera. And so I was really actually pretty surprised when I started doing that research because that, that wasn't what I was expecting to find at all. So um, let me ask you real quick, what do you think empathy is? What is empathy? When you hear that term, what's something that comes to mind? If you want to just put that in the chat box, that would be great. What is empathy? All right. So for me, I've always considered empathy feeling into another is kind of a phrase that I've picked up in the research that I, I really resonated with and, and kind of felt that that's what it was. I define empathy in The Caring Child as a complex skill that involves emotional, social, and cognitive processes. Um, and it's really the dance between those three types of emotional intelligence or those three types of processing that's going on in the brain. It's the dance of all of that, that kind of leads to what I would consider fully developed, healthy empathy. I see empathy as something that lives on a developmental plane, meaning it develops over time and it's highly dependent on the maturation of all of those skills, emotional, social, and cognitive. So as I was reading the research, there were two distinct schools of thought as to whether or not empathy includes compassion or whether or not empathy and compassion are two separate things and there's compelling arguments for both. I thought the argument honestly was a little silly and as I read through all the research to me it just really looked like yet another thing that's highly developmental in our brain. Lots of pieces of our social emotional selves are and something that can be highly influenced based on parenting strategies, based on environment and based on this dance of social emotional skills that our children possess. So I developed a model which I have here in front of you that I call the empathy development model as a way to conceptualize these really difficult constructs. So in this model you'll kind of see there is a grid between relationships that go from neglecting to nurturing and then boundaries that go from unhealthy to healthy boundaries. And within that quadrant grid, we have these different aspects of empathy development. And each of those aspects of de empathy development are really influenced then by our emotional skills, our social skills, and our cognitive skills. So, and I've given each of the little boxes a name because, you know, why not? Um, and through that, we can kind of have this way of not only understanding what empathy is, but more importantly, if you aren't living kind of in that upper right-hand box of fully developed empathy, which by the way, nobody is 100% of the time, but if you're not quite living there, what is it that you need to do to either get yourself there or if your children aren't quite living there, what do we need to do to get them there? And so for the next couple of slides, I'll just take each one of these quadrants apart so you can kind of really understand what's happening happening. So in that bottom left hand quadrant, um, if you look kind of back at this model, we have something called detach. And to me, if I were the voice of empathy, detach would say, I don't really feel much of anything in, emotionally. I don't feel my emotions. I don't really feel your emotions. I just don't really feel emotions. In that environment, what we're really seeing is that's the byproduct of some very loose boundaries or some very absent boundaries. And there's a lot of reasons why boundaries might not um, be developing. Within that box too, we tend to have absent or neglectful relationships. This correlates really, uh, really highly to absent and neglectful parenting styles or teaching styles, and it correlates to absent discipline styles. So when there's not adequate discipline present, when there's not adequate nurturing present or attachments present, and when parents for a variety of reasons are detached themselves, we tend to have this kind of detached uh, empathy development. The problem here is that we're not really growing our emotional intelligence and 
I find with emotional intelligence, it's really important. I often say with our gifted individuals in particular that the amount of the IQ that they get to use, so the amount of that potential, that raw potential that they're born with, that they get to actively use is highly dependent on the development of their emotional intelligence. You have to have certain amounts of emotional intelligence at play and at work to fully maximize your potential. Another problem that can come up um, if we're kind of living in that box is resiliency. Uh, oftentimes kids and adults in that box just aren't um, as resilient. They're really overwhelmed by life's situations. Now, right now with everything that's happening in the world, all of us are kind of at our maximum limits, our maximum tolerance um, for things that are traumatic in nature. We are globally going through a traumatic event. So it's important to kind of think of the time period before COVID, before all of this started happening, how was your child functioning? How are you functioning? Because right now you've got that plus an overlying um, traumatic event that's really significant that has thrown a lot of families into toxic levels of stress, which is a conversation for a different day and a different book. I've wrote a book about that too, though. Um, so if I'm in this detached kind of place, either myself or my children, really the best place to start to help move that needle into a different developmental box is through emotional literacy. Emotional literacy is when we develop words that go with our emotions. Oftentimes with our gifted individuals, we don't have automatic emotional literacy, which can sometimes fool us because oftentimes we think that our kids have a lot of emotional literacy because they have such a good naturally developing vocabulary, but that's not often the case. Often they really don't know how to talk about emotions. The other thing I would focus on um, if I was in this box is emotional regulation, which is how do I balance my emotions? How do I manage my emotions? The thing about that um, before I go forward is you actually cannot regulate what you cannot name. So you have to name it first. Um, Siegel is kind of, Dan Siegel is kind of famous for saying you got to name it to tame it. That's where that comes from. Um, it, in terms of how we develop as humans, we have to have self and social awareness before we can actually have behavioral regulation. All right. Let's say that I have developed my boundaries really well, but I'm still not so developed in terms of my nurturing relationships. In the graph that I showed, this would be the upper left-hand corner. I call that box disengaged. Within that environment, if I were the voice of empathy, I would say something like, I can think about your feelings, I can intellectually kind of go there, but I will never feel them. But because I can intellectually go there, I will often tell you what and how you're supposed to feel. I can tell you what to want. I'll tell you what to feel. I'll tell you all of those things. This is often a byproduct of tight boundaries. So healthy boundaries, healthier boundaries, um, but neglectful or absent relationships. This often happens when we develop our cognitive skills, but we have have not yet developed our social skills or our emotional skills. It tends to correlate to more of a punishment style of discipline. Um, that's when we're doing to a student. If you're kind of in, in the social justice windows of, you know, the two box, the four box and the with box. One of the things that can often happen if I'm living in that particular part of this graphic is I tend to develop a really heightened threat awareness. So I see a threat around every corner. I might have really poor relationships or poor attachments to others. And I often have some stunted emotional development. This can often happen in adults as a byproduct of traumatic events that haven't been kind of fully processed through. Um, but there are other reasons that this can happen as well. In children that can this can often happen as a result of a traumatic event or um, just some mismatch of parenting styles maybe there's two parents who are in a lot of disagreement um, on how to parent so some of these things can happen Probably the best place to start if I'm in that box and moving myself towards a more empathetic, well-developed empathy is to focus both on those emotional skills. So that emotional literacy and that emotional regulation that we talked about before, but I would also start focusing on those social skills. One of the easiest ways to think about social skills is to think about social awareness. And a good way to think about social awareness is being aware of the other, not just that other people exist, 
most of us can get that far, but that other people exist and they have needs and wants that are different from our own, but just as valid. And part of having well-developed social awareness is to be able to allow others, their opinions, their perspectives without making automatic judgments on that of being right, wrong, good, bad, et cetera. We live in a time where quite frankly, social awareness is tough to come by. Like we don't always find that. And so it's really about learning to start to develop that in our children. And I'll talk about some ways to, to explicitly develop some of these things before we're done this evening. If I kind of go back to that detached box, so the lower um, left, and I move across the bottom to the um, lower right, in this case, I call this box enmeshed. Enmeshed is when I can feel your feelings, but I feel them so much that I own your feelings. We see a lot of gifted children in particular kind of fall into this box as a byproduct of their naturally forming, highly developed empathy without some of the other skills in place yet. If I was the voice of um, empathy in the enmeshed box, I would say, I feel your feelings. In fact, I feel your feelings so much that I am distressed by your feelings. Some of us adults may be guilty of this at times too. This is when we're absorbing all of the emotional constructs and, and emotions of others and kind of claiming them as our own. In this scenario, this often happens because although we have we're good at forming relationships. We have good social awareness. Um, we have good attachments. We don't have very good boundaries. And so we haven't developed something that's called theory of the mind. Theory of the mind is when we understand where I start and stop as a sentient, sentient, uh, sentient being and where you start and stop as a sentient being. If you happen to have a student who is twice exceptional, they're on the autism spectrum as well as gifted, this is a very common problem place for them to be because of that lack of theory of mind. We tend to think that our students with autism aren't so empathetic, but I find that the opposite is actually true. They tend to become enmeshed, but they don't necessarily tend to become enmeshed with humans, but they often become very en enmeshed with the plight of animals, with the plight of other sentient beings. Um, in this particular box, it tends to correlate to a more per permissive or indulgent parenting style, parenting parents who want to be friends, teachers who want to be friends, and don't always set those firmer boundaries. And it really correlates to really enmeshed discipline styles as well. Some of the problems that can happen if we're living in that enmeshed box is we tend to develop anxiety more readily. We tend to have poor boundaries and as a result can find ourselves in abusive relationships or friendships where the other party is really taking advantage of us and we're kind of at a loss as to how to navigate that. So one of the things we can do to move ourselves from that lower right to that upper right, which is the goal, um, that full kind of bodied development, uh, developed uh, empathy, is to focus on our cognitive skills. And the cognitive skills in particular that I'm thinking about is our problem solving and our regulation skills. And so there's something called social problem solving, which is that ability to navigate social situations and to come up with creative solutions. Um, as we develop our creative thinking skills, we can often side by side develop some of those relationship problem solving skills and conflict navigation skills. Um, another thing that we can do in that area is start to learn how to regulate cognition. And we regulate our thinking when we get good at recognizing when we're being impulsive and then learning how to manage that impulsivity so that we can really focus on the thing we need to focus on in the face of competing stimuli. We can also shift from one thing to another pretty readily. Oftentimes, um, if you see people who you think are multitasking, really well. Multitasking actually isn't a thing. Um, there is something called shifting attention though, or shifting that shift tasking. Um, and that's actually when we're shifting between very different tasks readily and quickly and fluently. Um, and that oftentimes looks like multitasking. And, but those skills are necessary and, and kind of a way to start growing some of that cognition skill or those thinking skills. Finally, we have fully developed empathy. In this place, if I'm the voice of empathy, I would say, I see you and I feel you, but I am very clear that I am not you. I understand where your emotions start 
and mine and end and where mine start and end. I have healthy boundaries. I understand what nurturing relationships are and I seek those in my life from a parenting perspective and a discipline perspective or a teaching perspective. These are really balanced approaches where we have good boundaries, but we all also have some flexibility. Um, in this case, we're developing really healthy attachments and very high levels of resiliency. See, resiliency is really just all of our emotional quotient skills, that social skills, those emotional skills and those cognitive skills, when they all all integrate together, that forms the biology of resiliency. That's how we make really resilient humans. Um, so if I'm living in that box, and like I said, many of us flirt with that box, but it's really hard, especially when we're stressed out, to live in that box with any kind of regularity. We just need to keep growing and practicing those social skills, those emotional skills, and those cognitive skills. And by doing that, then we are prepared for the different things that life throws our way. Those of us who had some experience being in that kind of part of the model before everything hit in February and March, we're having, I wouldn't say we're having an easier time because I think everybody's having a hard time, but we have some skills to draw on that we might not have had otherwise. And I think that's, that's what's important, right? We want to develop these skills so that when life throws us, whatever the heck life is going to throw us, we have some skills we can rely on and some habits of mind that we can rely on that will help navigate through that. So one of the things I want to think about a little bit is giftedness in particular and how that relates to this model of empathy development. Now with giftedness, we have certain areas of overexcitability or I call them intensity that really can throw a little bit of a monkey wrench into this easy development. And the thing that most often comes to mind is our emotional intensity. That's something I write a lot about and research a lot about. So with emotional intensity, those are kids, uh, pretty much every gifted kid I've ever met is also emotionally very intense. I consider it the opposite side of the same coin. And as a result, they tend to develop empathy skills very readily. They tend to be able to use those imagination skills that they have and kind of think into another human, lean into another human emotionally pretty readily. But oftentimes this will lead to empathy enmeshment, which is kind of that enmeshment box that I alluded to. One of the other things that can happen is because they tend to experience such big emotions so regularly, especially when they're younger, regulating emotions becomes really, really difficult. And so it is very, difficult sometimes to move out of that detached box. Um, even if they have, you know, boundaries being set at home and relationships that are pretty healthy, they can often wind up either in that disengaged box or in that enmeshed box pretty easily. And that is a lot related to that um, ability, what, where is their ability to kind of regulate their emotions and their emotional status. And then finally, that social awareness part. Sometimes with our younger gifted kids in particular, that social awareness appears to not be there as strong as we want it to. So even though they can feel into another, they don't always recognize the environmental situations that a person might be going through. They tend to look at the world still through really finite terms, very black and white. They tend to have a black and white sense of justice or a rigid sense of justice. And so all of that can influence that capacity to develop empathy. But as parents, these are all things that we can work on. And I really spend the second half of the book talking very explicitly about ways that we can support children and help children navigate through some of this. So the three kind of biggest areas that I like to focus in on, the first one is developing healthy family relationships. Now more than ever, you know, we're spending a lot more times with our kids potentially than maybe we did a year ago. And so it's one of two things is happening. Either we're getting really healthy in those relationships or we're all totally getting on each other's nerves or both, right? And so this is really where we wanna take a breather and take a moment and have deep conversations, have time for fun, play games together. Some of those things get out of that day to day sometimes and then remain really curious about the way your child might be showing up. Maybe they're experiencing 
experiencing really high levels of stress and anxiety right now. And that might be coming out as some obsessive compulsive behavior or some more aggressive than we're used to or more verbal protesting or arguing than you're used to or more tantruming than you're used to. Stay curious about those things and try to figure out why that might be happening. What's underneath all of that? What's really going on? And is it possible that my child just doesn't quite have the emotional literacy, the words to speak about their emotions that I thought they had, and therefore they're having a hard time telling me what's up? Clear and appropriate boundaries is another thing that's exceptionally important, especially right now. The clearer the boundaries and the more we stick to those boundaries and those expectations with our children, the safer the environment is for our children. And because of the toxic nature of the world right now and kind of the events we've been going through, it is critical that our kids feel really, really safe within their environment. And the best way to feel safe with a parent is when we all decide we're going to take role of parent, not role of friend. Now, if you have adult children who are just in your life a lot right now with everything going on, maybe they've moved home. Yes, you can be friend, but you still want to have boundaries. It's still your house. Your rules still need to apply all of those things. And then finally, emotional literacy. Don't assume that gifted kids have strong emotional literacy. I find that that tends to lag behind. You want to talk um, take all of the daily moments that you have in any given day and model and teach what emotional literacy is and how to do it. So one of the things I did, especially when my kids were younger, and one of the things I work with families to do is to narrate your day a little bit. And so if you're angry, use that word. I'm really angry right now, or I'm really frustrated right now, or whatever it is that the word is that you need to use so that you can start developing that emotional literacy. And as your children get older, move beyond things like angry, sad, et cetera, et cetera, disgusted, whatever, and move into the more complex, nuanced words. Um, if you Google emotional wheel, there's, there's literally millions of emotional wheels out there. Um, a good friend of mine who is an author wrote a series of resource materials for writers, one of them being called an emotion thesaurus. That thing's a gold mine. If you really want to go a little crazy teaching emotional literacy, pick up that book because that thing's got more words than you could ever want for any emotion you could ever conceptualize. And as your kids become in secondary school, so middle school and high school, it's important to increase the nuance around emotions. Most of us as adults understand that emotions are highly varied and complex and in our gifted individuals tend to layer on incredibly. And so it's important that we help our kids develop that same kind of emotional literacy. A couple of other things we can do, um, normalize what it means to be an intense human. Our gifted kids are growing up believing that their intensities are somehow inherently bad. That works against their capacity to develop those social, emotional, and cognitive skills. And so we need to normalize that. We need to help them understand that Feeling passionately about the world, having giant feelings for little things is not a bad thing. In fact, having giant feelings about the world is a common characteristic with giftedness. I um, have had the benefit of working with gifted kids all across the United States in different workshops. And that is the thing that stands out the most in the feedback I get from children is having them say, oh my gosh, I had no idea. And I'm sorry for the typo I just noticed. Um, I have no idea that these intensities that I have are normal. And in fact, we can reframe them into strengths. And then, um, yeah, and then the, the big thing is just don't forget about those coping skills also. You know, our kids need extra help sometimes figuring out how to regulate. One of the things I'm going to stop sharing just because I want to um, see you guys. Uh, one of the things that... Um, I did in the book that I really um, spent a lot of time with that was important to me to do in the book was to provide examples of 
day-to-day, moment-to-moment ways that we can develop empathy in children. And so I took something I had done in the very first book I wrote 10 years ago, Emotional Intensity and Gifted Students. The last third of that book is all role plays. So I present a scenario and a typical way a family might talk about that. And then I kind of point out some missed opportunities and then another example of that exact same conversation with some of that stuff corrected. I wanted to do the same thing in The Caring Child. I haven't done that in any of the books since Emotional Intensity, and I've I've put out about eight books, eight, nine books, Um, but I wanted to do that in The Caring Child. And one of the things I really wanted to show in The Caring Child is most of us are actually doing a pretty good job as parents. Like we're engaging in good conversations. We're having a lot of meaning, but we're missing opportunities to go deeper. We're missing opportunities to really enhance some of those social, emotional, and cognitive skills and to help kids develop perspective and kindness and and compassion, some of these things that are important elements to empathy. And so I presented a variety of different scenarios, things that happen at home, home, things that happen at school, and um, presented the scenario and a conversation. And, And my guess is, and I've heard some feedback from readers that this is what they felt, you know, you read that first kind of conversation and it seems as normal as normal can be. And it leaves readers thinking, well, what the heck's wrong with that? Like, this is perfectly good until I rip it apart. And you kind of see where there were missed opportunities. Philosophically, I believe we have hundreds of opportunities every single day to model empathy, to demonstrate empathy to our children and to help our children grow their empathy. And we tend to miss out on those opportunities that we have because we're too busy. We're busy doing other things. Our minds are going a million miles an hour. I'd say it's even more true now. Of course, The Caring Child was written before COVID. And so I'd say it's even more true now than it was um, then. We're just busy and we're missing out on some golden opportunities to help grow and develop empathy. And we need it more than ever now. And so if, if you walk away with anything um, besides an, a new model for how to look at, at empathy and how to develop some of this stuff, I want you to walk away really thinking, what can I do tomorrow? What moment can I make use of tomorrow that can really help our children develop their empathy? What can I do tomorrow that has me modeling empathy in a different way? And yeah, that's kind of what I want to leave you with tonight. And I wanted to give us a, at least a good half hour for questions. So this is a good time to literally ask me anything. You can ask me something about empathy development, but if you have something else going on that you want to ask me about, please feel free to ask and, and we can use the chat um, for that. Um, that's probably the best way. I think there's a Q&A feature too. We can probably use that. Um, so yeah. Let me open it up to questions. If we have any, or you can unmute yourself if you're, I don't know if they, can they unmute themselves? I don't know if they can. Oh, here we go. Can I talk a little bit about how to address Zoom fatigue? Oh my gosh, yes. Zoom fatigue is a thing, holy cow. So all of us are online, right? Our kids are online anywhere from a few hours a day to six or seven hours a day. Online learning, I don't think it's harder to develop empathy actually in an online environment. I think it's different. And so a couple of things happen when we're online. Oftentimes, if we're sitting in Zoom meetings and our Zoom host, our facilitator doesn't know how to utilize a million different apps out there to kind of gamify what we're doing, then the conversation becomes a lot like it is right now, right? This one-sided conversation. I'm dumping information on you. You're supposed to absorb it, do something later on with it maybe and come back. If that's all I'm doing, you're absolutely correct. I'm losing out on opportunities to foster and develop empathy. 
If on the other hand, I am utilizing Zoom and I'm utilizing breakout sessions or we're doing, we're using AHA slides or cahoots and we're gamifying things and you're having an opportunity to really, really um, participate in it. Now I have some opportunities to develop empathy. I can, if I am the teacher, go into the different breakout rooms and call out good things that I'm seeing. When I'm seeing kids kind of exchange information, things like that, I can call out missed opportunities that I'm seeing. And as a parent, I can engage with my kid about their experiences online. The truth of the matter is most of our kids are really exhausted from being on Zoom. It's a different kind of a skill set. It's not as interactive. And what we're forgetting is Kids in school have these natural breaks that occur at the longest every 40, 45 minutes. At the shortest, it might be every 10, 15 minutes when they're rotating to different activities. We've kind of lost that in our how we're doing online learning right now. And as a result, our kids aren't getting the activity that they need. They're not getting the physical breaks that they need. They're not getting movement breaks that they need. To educators that I work with, I've been highly recommending building in brain breaks every 20 to 25 minutes um, so kids can get up and move around to parents, I have recommended any opportunity you get in between activities at home, you know, that are online for school, introduce brain breaks, movement breaks, get them outside, get them into a different environment, have a different kind of a conversation. And then when they are done with school, limit that screen time for a little bit. Now your kids won't want that because they haven't been able to play their favorite games all day long and they're going to want to, but we have to give that brain a little bit of a break and engage in something different. Now, if your kid is extremely stressed out during this time, it's important to engage in things like coloring, things like um, mindfulness, different things get, that can release some of what's happening in the body. Um, I do a seminar every now and then on the different happiness um, chemicals in our brain and kind of how to hack them. Um, so yeah, those are some things we can, we can do there. So Zoom fatigue's real, it's a thing. Um, and we have to make use of the time that kids are not online to do a better job engaging to help build some of those empathy skills. So another question, couple of questions, what are some common mistakes you are seeing with emotional young kids during COVID? And do we need to be worried about our kids not interacting with other kids? Okay, common mistakes that I see um, during COVID with emotional kids, um, couple of things. I don't think as parents, what I see often as parents is that we are have kind of taken over the emotional regulation and the executive functioning for our kids, right? And so we are organizing our kids, we're organizing their day, um, we're making sure that they get everything done, we're even organizing their coping strategies um, when they lose it a little bit. And to a degree, that's okay. Like if your kid's really struggling and you decide, okay, school's done for the day, like that's okay. Sometimes you as a parent need to make that call. But wouldn't it be better if instead of just making that decision, we said to our kid, do you need to be done for today or do you just need a break? Or could we say something like, what can you do to re-regulate yourself right now? and asking the questions and pushing on our kids to come up with answers. Oftentimes they'll come up with solutions that maybe won't work, but letting them try that solution and then dealing with the aftermath and then helping them regroup and adjust that plan. I think those things are more important um, because then we're actually building the skill and that's what's so important. We've got to help them build and practice their skills. These skills are learned. They're not something that just are innate. They're things that we have to practice over and over and over in a variety of scenarios to build those neural pathways and to integrate that processing in our brain. The more highly integrated our brain is, that's the, our biology for um, resilience. In terms of worrying about whether or not kids are interacting with other kids, here's the thing. Yes, in-person interaction is important. Absolutely, we are social beings. There are things related to touch and proximity that are important for our development. That being said, we have overblown 
the lack of social interaction, in-person interaction as being like the thing that's gonna bring down a generation. I don't agree with that actually. You can absolutely um, socially connect and still be physically distant. It has to do with what you're doing online. So if you're having a deep conversation, if you're having opportunities to build something together, to play a game together, um, to build cooperative problem solving skills, to innovate together, maybe you're gonna make a movie together or write something together. All of these are opportunities to develop some pretty deep um, social emotional skills and cognitive skills. When you're doing that, our kids are still developing. They're developing quite well. We have lots and lots of introverted children who get very extroverted online and they're able to connect in ways virtually that they couldn't do in person because of the energy exchange and how taxing that is on their system. So I think it's important to recognize that you can still have really good development and really good growth as long as you are socially connecting, be it virtually or in person. And then obviously most optimal is will be when we can safely um, get together in person. I do think it's important to help kids understand why why we can't do in person to the same degree that we used to be able to. I think that's um, equally important. We had a Facebook comment. Um, the intensities my kids are demonstrating lately are overwhelming my ability to be empathetic towards them. Oh my gosh, can we all say yes to that one? I think we've all felt it. Um, I know they're stressed, but so are the adults. Do you have suggestions for parents on how to be emotionally present when we are also just so tapped out? Oh my gosh. Okay, so first and foremost, a, I love this question, best question ever, so honest. Um, yes, the very first thing you need to recognize is that you are in fact emotionally tapped out and then you need to prioritize your own self-care. All of us adults tend to have to-do lists 50 million miles long and we are often not on that list at all. We need to change our thinking around that and we need to make us first on the list. There's a couple of reasons for that that are scientifically based. First off, we need to think of it just like they say on the airplane, right? When if oxygen is needed on an airplane, put your mask on first before you put the mask on your child. This is so you actually are functional and able to put the mask on your child. Self-care works very much like an oxygen mask. We have to take care of ourselves first. Sometimes this means something as simple as going into the bathroom, locking the door, ignoring the chaos on the other side of that door and taking, you know, two minutes to calm your breathing down and to regulate your own kind of um, mental emotions right in that moment. Sometimes that's all that you're going to get right then. And then you're going to have to do something a little later, but don't be afraid to ask for that. I mean, even with my own children, when chaos would be blowing up, I, I absolutely would set that boundary sometimes and say, mom's not available right now. You're just going to have to figure it out. Don't kill each other, you know, <laughs> and give me five minutes to, to re-regulate. Otherwise I'm going to lose my grip. So that's the first and foremost thing. And then you have to come up with a longer term solution for your own self-care. So what is it that makes you really happy? And when was the last time you did it? Find time to do those things. You are no good to your children if you cannot be emotionally present. Another thing that's important, I'll, I'll kind of give you this this example. Um, I have two children and my husband and myself, that's our typical household. Three of us are introverted humans. What does this mean? This means that I, we, the three of us need solitude in order to renew emotionally, especially at the end of a day. Um, my husband's an educator. I've worked in education for years. Those are very face-to-face, -face, constantly on for hours. And so end of the day, we absolutely need to chill out. My oldest daughter is very much the same way. My youngest daughter is a little bit more extroverted, especially when she was young. So the way she would renew was through social contact. In particular, she really liked to connect with one of the two adults and kind of orally narrate her day and go into explicit detail, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That was really hard for me initially um, because I, I, I wasn't emotionally available. And so being present for her was really difficult, but I did not want to have her not be able to renew. So I learned to build about 20 minutes into my day. I, at the time, was very fortunate because I lived really close to home. Um, so I conceivably could get home in about five or 10 minutes at the end of the day. 
I added about 10, 15 minutes to my day and I would just go park and I would journal or I would listen to soft music or whatever I needed to do to regulate myself and give myself that downtime I needed so that when I got back home, I could immediately be available to her um, to meet her need. And so that was just kind of how we did it. And if if, if I wasn't able to do that, if something ran long at work or anything like that, um, I just told her, you got to give me 10 minutes, give me 10 minutes, and then I'm available. I know as a child growing up, my mother was an introverted single mom, excuse me, mom with a very intense job. And we had a rule in my house that the first half hour after she picked me up from daycare, I basically didn't talk to her. I would watch her. She would vegetate on the couch and watch the news. I just thought it was because she liked the news. It wasn't until I was an adult that I found out, no, that was how she decompressed at the end of the day. And then after that, she, I had her undivided attention. And so I think these are fair trade-offs. You just have to kind of be willing to prioritize yourself. And that's very difficult for many parents. And it's not something that's always socially accepted. It's not something we think about or, and talk about. So that's how I would answer that question. Um, where, ca where can we go uh, for social emotional resources other than my book? Um, there's lots of places. So Castle, um, C-A-S-E-L, has all kinds of resources on their website. And if you Google free social emotional resources parents, you're going to come up with a, a bazillion different resources. Right now in particular, many, many organizations, Castle, Second Step, and other organizations have all kinds of free resources for parents. I know um, the former agency I used to work for, Collaborative Learning Solutions, has a whole bunch of social emotional lessons on their website. They're free, 15-minute lessons. You can do them every day. They absolutely will build a lot of these same skills. So that, those are um, probably the easiest places you can get some good resources for free. How do we help our gifted kids who are getting really bored with distance learning? It seems harder, yeah, for the teachers to personalize learning. I agree. Um, I can add things, but it's so hard to get my kiddo, seven years old, first grade, to do the required work. He always says he's bored. Okay, so yes, I agree. They are they are struggling, and differentiation is getting more and more difficult. So first and foremost, um, you kind of need to to adapt an if then kind of modality with them. So what is that? If then means if we do this, then we can do this. So by all means, have some enrichment for your kids. Maybe it's a project, a favorite thing they wanted to look at. Um, also true because of everything that's been going on. There's a bazillion different museums that kids can fit visit virtually. There's all kinds of classes if your kid is particularly gifted um, that they can take from various different universities and various different high schools that are being offered for free. Um, so there is different things out there that they can do. Um, all different uh, organizations are providing additional enrichment kinds of things for kids, but you got to get them to do the stuff first. And so the deal that you make with the kid is, I get you at your board, I get it. What can we do to make this more fun? I know with some of the more menial tasks that happen in first and second grade that are really boring, I often had to play beat the clock with my kids. Okay, who's going to do it faster, me or you? And I'd set a timer um, just to get them to do it. Otherwise, like a sheet of math that they could do in their sleep literally would take all day. Like it was ridiculous. Um, so that those are some tricks that you can use, but you just have to help them understand that do this, then you get the other, do this, then you get the other, do this, then you get the other. Now, the caveat to that is if you're getting 10 sheets of the exact same thing that your child has demonstrated mastery of on sheet number one, that's a conversation with the teacher right? Because we would not ask someone who had just learned how to vacuum and knows, has mastered the art of vacuuming a living room. We wouldn't have them repeatedly let vacuum the same living room over and over and over just to show us mastery, right? That's the silliest thing we've ever heard. And nobody would be willing to do it. I wouldn't be willing to do that. It's the same thing when we're having kids do something that they've already shown mastery of and we're having them do it over and over and over. And so that's a different conversation. That's, you know, talking with kid, the teacher saying, okay, let's talk about, you know, mastery and differentiation and how we're gonna do this even in an online environment. 
Okay, I'm stuck with being able to name the feeling in order to tame it, or you cannot regulate which can cannot name. Before that vocabulary is well developed, can regulation come from bringing the, um, a child back into their bodily sensations and getting them um, to describe how their body feels? Yes, but the beauty is if they can describe how their body feels, that is a, that is building emotional literacy. So they may not have a name for anger, but they can tell you where anger lives in their body and what it's doing to their body. My arms feel tight. My jaw feels tight. My neck feels tight. So yes, to a limited degree, you can get definitely some regulation because the minute you can get your kids back fully in their bodies, you can begin to regulate. You will not have preemptive regulation. So the stuff that happens before it gets too bad until you can really start getting the vocabulary to go with it. And so one of the things you can do as you're getting them back into their body, how does, how does, how are you feeling in your body right now? What's tight, what's loose, et cetera, et cetera, is you can have a conversation of, wow, you know, when some people have really major tightness in their jaw or their palms get really sweaty, or they start to get a little pounding in their headache, some people call that stress or anxiety. Do you have a name for that? So that's a way you can combine everything. And you can get well-developed vocabulary in toddlers for emotional regulation. You can get happy, sad, joyful, um, disgust, fear, like the basics. All you got to do is grab the movie Inside Out. And if you don't own it or you're not on Disney Plus, you can literally just get the videos that describe each of the emotions and you can help kids learn basic emotions just from that. And I've done it with kids at two and three years old. So um, it's absolutely possible to start it really young. And yeah, combine the two. Embodiment work is always good. And embodiment work is when we're just talking about um, how things feel in the body. All right. Any other questions? These were good. You guys are a good group. All right. I think that's it. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm just in the process of drafting another question. I feel, sure. Christine, may I ask you, of course. what advice would you give to our kids right now who are very upset with the way our world is? So a couple of things. One, um, we need to normalize kids feeling really, really upset. Like, of course, they're feeling really upset. Our gifted kids in particular have a high perception of what's happening in the world. They get it. They see the big picture of it all. So of course, they are upset. What they need to learn to how to do is not get paralyzed from that emotion, right? Because that can be an all consumption kind of consuming emotion that can make us feel very hopeless at times. And so one of the things I would really recommend for that is figuring out if you could change one thing, what would it be? And then helping them take some action. And so there's all different kinds of action kids can take. One of my favorite stories about a child um, taking action, I have two actually, about a child taking action. One was about a late elementary, early middle school age child who had learned about Martin Luther King, was really upset, Martin Luther King Jr., was really upset that there was no monument for him um, at all, anywhere that she could find. And she helped start the fund that eventually wound up being the fund that paid for the Martin Luther King statue that's in DC now. Um, that actually started with a kid and that started with a kid asking questions and feeling frustrated about the world. I have another great story of a child who became an entrepreneur um, and she, um, she used to make like all kinds of crafts for your hair and stuff like that. And she decided she wanted to sell that and give that, give a huge portion of that money to local charities because she was really upset about things she was seeing within her community and she wanted to find a way to help. And that's kind of how she helped. And she rallied that into um, a big business. And, you know, by the time she was 15, she had done TED Talks and had been speaking everywhere. And so we have examples of this all over the place of opportunity. So service is one of the best things you can do. Um, one of the other things you can do is pull the world in a little smaller and first and foremost, 
in, engage in a gratitude practice if you don't have one. So that's what's something I can be thankful for today. And I usually break that into what's something about school I can be thankful for, what's something about home and my relationships at home I can be thankful for, and what's something that's just about me that I can be thankful for. But certainly if you have a kid who's really frustrated with world events, you can also say what's something thank I can be thankful for about the world as a whole. Um, do that every day. And then jumps for joy, which is when we acknowledge little celebrations every day. I actually created a journal, an interactive journal that has all of these components in it. So it has an opportunity to practice gratitude, to practice celebrations, to monitor your own lifestyle choices in terms of sleep and healthy eating and play and movement, um, as well as right looking at your own intensities and your regulation and seeing it from a strengths lens, as well as just just journaling. And so that kind of thing, that kind of um, daily action can really help um, pull kids back into balance when they're angry. And then couple that with taking action on something they're passionate about. And that's really the best way. What we don't want to do is silence kids when they're angry because they have a right, they're sentient feeling beings on this planet as well. And there's a lot going on. So they have a right to, to their feelings. Um, it's been heaven for my kid not to have any social interaction since COVID. That's true for a lot of kids. Um, should I still push him to socialize when he's happy not socializing or else he gets very anxious when pushed to socialize even through Zoom? Yes. So we have to, kids have to be functionally social, right? They have to have a venue that they can socialize in because we are social human beings and we've got boatloads of research that say it's really important that we do so. That being said, there's nothing wrong with making it less than we probably have in our, in our head. So it's about monitoring and balance. Where's that sweet spot for your child when they get socialization that's going to help them and they can start to not get too anxious about being social, right? That's a good cue that you probably need to do a little more than you're doing, especially if that tolerance level is really low. So we want to build a little tolerance, but we don't want to do so much that we cause a serious anxiety um, problem or social anxiety disorder because we just pushed it too hard too fast. Oftentimes what happens is we have an extroverted parent. So a parent who's used to social interaction and who gains a lot through social interaction and that's how they renew at the end of the day and they have given birth to a um, child who is an introvert who needs a lot less of that and then we think oh they only have one or two friends so this is a problem they need more friends meanwhile they're saying yeah but I have one or two really good friends and I feel good <laughs> So it's a matter of understanding that part too. What's, you know, what's everybody's kind of personality? Are we introverts? Are we extroverts? Are we a little bit of both? What's happening with that? And then putting all of that within the context of we are social human beings and a certain amount of social interaction is actually really necessary for our overall development. All right. Any more? I think that's it. Hopefully this has been helpful. Yes, Christine, thank you so much. I, I can say that I'm leaving this talk feeling more purposeful and more aware. That's fantastic. That's exactly what I want to hear. Yay. <laughs> thank you so much, Christine. You are most welcome. Thank you all very, very much. And if there's ever anything that you need, um, you can usually find me through social media or through my website if you have some specific questions that you have or on the back of all of my books in the author section is always a way to get in touch with me and I love hearing from readers so. Anytime. All right, we have a couple comments. Thank you so much. Thank you, Abby. Thank you for joining in. Thank you, Suzanne for the kind comments earlier. To wrap it up, um, we are in the middle of our readathon campaign. And if you feel it in your heart to support us, please text the code READ with IEA24432. And again, today is also our $10 Tuesday challenge. And the winner of the most $10 donations get to attend a four part online spyglass workshop series for free. Thank you in advance for all of your support. And I wish you all a great and peaceful evening. Bye. Bye, everyone.